So I'm representing today Pivotal Technologies with a subject gRPC with less effort. The less effort comes after having done the transformation to be even sourced and having done the work in order to simplify it. But if you don't, uh, we're going to go through the steps that get us there. So first, uh, I was doing applicative pen testing. Uh, I was doing security review for banks before. Now I'm more in the building and trying to build more securely things. And uh, we're doing a bit of branding. We call it Infinite Enterprise. But it's basically the way to have pure containers everywhere, the deployment methodology to secure everything from small to medium-sized companies and do digital transformation. And so we, do, we try to do secure patterns, develop libraries for infrastructure as code for, for uh, your cloud infrastructure, for some of your on-premise. But right now, it's very focused on GCP. And we try to simplify maintenance of, uh, of microservices and maintain huge fleets of microservices for our clients, but also try to develop them faster or transform those groups faster. Uh, so you can see on top, uh, our website is Pivotal Tech, and our GitHub is Pivotal Dash Tech. Uh, some of the technologies we use very quickly, so because it was mentioned before, we only use Flutter, or mostly Flutter, for front-end, uh, for all platforms, and we've been using web for almost as long as it's been available, almost three years. Uh, we try to maintain our own CI, because our CI and CD are very custom, so we use mostly Tekton, and some GitHub actions when you need root level privileges when you run your CI. Bitrise for mobile, otherwise everything is in bash for that part. Uh, continuous deployment is, uh, was Google Pub, is Google PubSub in order to deploy in uh, network restricted environments using Argo, the Argo stack before and now we have our custom deployer that builds on top of Argo. For the deployment, uh, heavy users of Terraform Cloud and Terraform users of Vault and HashiCorp tools, uh, mainly Kubernetes, sometimes Google Cloud Run, and uh, the technologies now is mostly Istio for service mesh, Ingress Gateway, Egress Gateway, and the Ori stack for authentication. Uh, and the last but not least, even store MFSD for even sourcing. Uh, if you don't know what even sourcing is, we're gonna talk about it a bit later. And those libraries do the heavy lifting for us to transform, because if we don't have libraries, you can't actually go faster. Um, so the OWASP top 10 for 2023 is mostly about broken le object level authorization, which is an authorization problem. I'm gonna define it a bit later. Uh, broken authentication, uh, so it means uh, knowing who your users are, what, which differentiates authentication from authorization. Authorization is also the topic, but at the object level property on number three, uh, unrestricted resource consumption, mostly DOS and DDoS, not going to be talked by me in this, top, uh, in this talk. And the fifth subject as well will be addressed by uh, the infrastructure automation during the talk. So it's one, two, uh, one, two three, and five of the top ten. Uh, the objective is to show how we secure directly from Frodobuff and ensure that infrastructure is secure by default or non-functioning. So we try to have either functioning services and secure or non-functioning at all. So that's what we try to do, because otherwise, if you have to review your code every time you deliver hundreds of endpoints, you wouldn't deliver fast. Uh, so now it's kind of, bear with me, it's the template for uh, some of our large-scale transformations. So as you can see here, there's a wide-level project. It can be one or more Kubernetes projects, but mostly it's like the front end, but also front end and customization of the endpoints. So there's a, it gets into a, a Kubernetes cluster with an Istio ingress gateway. It goes to an authentication service uh, here represented by Ori of Keeper for the white label. And then it talks in gRPC web through a translation layer of Istio ingress to a proxy. And through that proxy, it goes to an internal uh, gateway and from the internal gateway to a core. Why do we do it like that? It's because we've automated authorization, and because you have automated authorization, it's simpler to have less endpoints 
but more closely maintain and uh, manage them for your clients. Because if you don't have that automated authorization and leave developers to do it, it's more secure to develop uh, one set of endpoints per white label, and that's what we've seen a lot of our uh, competitors and others do when they don't have their built-in authorization. But once you do have a core for which you can control authorization very tightly and do just the customization needed for some of the white labels, it's more efficient to have uh, many white labels in front and then have a gigantic uh, distributed microservice core for the core. And the core retakes the same logic as, as, uh, as mentioned before, except uh, we're using a gRPC interceptor directly at the microservice level, and it's templated in order to be always there or uh, the service wouldn't be deployed. And it goes to an authorization service that does, that does rule expansion for us, and then finally to uh, an authorization engine behind. Uh, the roots, as I'm mentioning in the text here, you're much better off defining completely new rules for your HTTP2, HTTP3 HTTP routes, whether it's cloud or on-premise. The reason being, there's a huge new attack vector uh, mentioned by James Kettle from the Burp uh, group, um, which is uh, HTTP2 request smuggling or HTTP2 downgrade. So if you're on-premise, don't share your load balancers for HTTP1 workloads and HTTP2 workloads. Define completely new endpoints for, for it because uh, to my knowledge, it's, it becomes a lot harder at your different load balancers to be managing correctly. You're at heavy risk of either smuggling or uh, HTTP2 downgrade or of a more complex problem related to caching. So um, uh, we recommend to, to really separate those two types of routes, whether on cloud or on-premise, not to share any HTTP2 or HTTP3. And the last thing from experience, when you're using those new protocol, get ready to patch everything in your critical path, which means uh, your, um, your cloud configurations to be regularly updated, whether you're using uh, uh, Google Cloud Load Balancer or AWS Cloud Load Balancer or uh, uh, other large cloud providers in order to do your DDoS protection, your Kubernetes cluster, your Istio Ingress, um, keep them at least on stable, your Ori of Keeper, Everything that is in the critical path, uh, including the proxy, has to be regularly updated because if you have a vulnerability, the chain is so long that it has to be able to be patched quickly. So if you get into those new things, IEC is mandatory and doing things fast is also really necessary. Uh, so now let's get into one simple service. Uh, why do I say that it's simple? Because there's only one endpoint. And the endpoint is very simple. It's a simple read. Uh, the logic here why we're using Proto and talking about Proto for security is not, an, uh, as you can see here, not only about speed, because people talk about Proto a lot for speed, but it's about the IDL and the fact that you can template directly from the code um, CRDs for the deployment of your security, so that your security is automated directly from the Proto level. Your Protos are compiled and then are deployed through your CD at, uh, the, uh, the, uh, related to the different configurations that we see here, here for authentication, and under for authorization, and the first one being for the white label. So when we go back to this schema, uh, the, you have the off keeper config here for the white label, and a second off keeper config here for the core, and uh, you can see here the, the config for the white label. As you can see here, it's white label player with authenticators player GWT. And the name of uh, the endpoint is get user wallet and get user wallet response. But at the core level, you can see that it transforms into get player wallet response and get player request. So on, the, on that proxy, you can transform the calls and uh, modify them a bit without the, the white label knowing that they're actually using another interface. So that's one of the big advantages as well of having two different sets of configuration and security. You, ca you have like basically two levels of control. And uh, as well, uh, the aspect that we really want to talk about here, it's a simple wallet with a requester ID and a player ID 
And authorization, if I haven't mentioned it before, it's knowing what the person should have access to or who, who it is. Uh, the requester being the person requesting uh, uh, the, for the asset. And the player ID is who is he requesting it for. So knowing if a requester is allowed to request for the player ID is what we solve for the authorization. So our custom option here that you can see is made for uh, authentication purposes to validate the JOT. Uh, so here it's X1 platform for the core. And uh, the other one that we saw previously is for the white label. And the authorization is evaluated for now for us on the core. It can also be evaluated on the, on the user, I mean, on the white label end, but the validations didn't completely make sense because we're doing absolutely the same checks twice. So we ended up doing more on the core and add another level of platform check on the core. And so you can see here our custom structure with a player and the player ID and using a permission uh, as player viewer on the requester, uh, sorry, I, I inverted. The requester ID uh, is a player viewer on the protofield player ID. And so from this, uh, from this authorization check, uh, we make sure directly by reading our RPC that there's a validation of player, uh, player viewer needed in order to access that wallet uh, on the core. So in order to summarize, the, the big objective here is to delegate a lot of the security to be templated directly from the protos, use custom annotations, to drive at each layer of the interfaces. So as soon as we patch or upgrade any interface, uh, the security is deducted automatically at different le levels of uh, deployment, and you don't have to maintain as much once it is built. The problem, again, being you have to build it or su find someone who helps you uh, get through that transition of supporting the templates at the different levels. Uh, the, and so we're going to get now into uh, the templated value that is generated. I won't bore you guys too much, but for the white label, it has, again, the required scope, uh, the audiences, the uh, issuers. But uh, more interestingly, the URL is automatically templated and generated directly from the proto. So as a user uh, or a developer, you generate your proto, and all the security is deployed for you. But your authorization is not. Your authorization requires a few other things that um, will be added by infrastructure later on in order to make it available. Uh, the, that's for the white label. And we're going to get uh, rapidly into the core. As you can see, it's very similar. It's also templated. The infrastructure generates the, the URLs for, for it. We're using Hydra from Ori in order to manage it. And we're using the different scopes. And again, uh, the developer doesn't have to type any of that. Most of that is generated directly from the, the, the options here, plus deployment manifests in order to enrich the authenticator's name here, platform GWT, and here, player GWT, so the template knows to look for those two fields in order to enrich it for automatic deployment. Um, so how do we enforce at the final microservice that the interceptor will always be there. So otherwise, what's the point of doing all of this if it wasn't automatic? So we're using uh, templated Go and code generation in order to enforce that all developers are following our code base and our methodology. So it goes from here, the core interceptor, to databases, to external services, to mounted services, to shared secrets, in order to patch hundreds, now hundreds, or thousands of micro microservices directly by patching a code gen. So uh, we can see here that the unary server interceptor is present. We have a value to remove the authorization if need be. Uh, so it's a, there's a bypass that is in the code, but it's not available in config, just available for the developers in their local Kubernetes for the authorization while they're working, because if they don't have the entire flow, uh, they can't work uh, if we don't add uh, the authorization engines that come later on 
uh, but I'm going to talk about how we actually add those authorizations. So ju that's just to show that you can have an enforcement that inf infrastructure level in the microservices by controlling tightly the code of those microservices before they get to the authorization. And here we have the config that goes along the service that we saw earlier with a player, player viewer. Uh, this is a, a syntax from Google from their white paper from 20, uh, 2018 uh, called Zanzibar. Uh, that spec um, was described in the white paper, but the code is not open source. So we implemented the entire spec in 2020. Uh, as you can see here, um, uh, the description is basically when you read it, it's made to expand upon the list and expand the user sets in order to understand what's happening. So I'm going to go, going to try to go slowly with you guys so you understand. But the objective is, at the end of the day, to have uh, something that's a bit more easy to read for the infrastructure specialists. Because as a developer, you only see the tags that are here. So player viewer, player editor, or player manager. And in between is the deduction of rules. So we're going to go uh, through the simple one. So the, uh, the player viewer is either directly a player viewer or is somebody computed from a player editor. So a player editor is also a player viewer. So if you give that property to someone else, you'll automatically get assets to player viewers. And now a player editor is either directly a player editor through the use case of a, of a word this. This means directly that, uh, the, the term player editor, or from uh, a computed user set from player owner. So if you have a property player owner, you're automatically a player editor and automatically a player viewer. And so if you start to build more complex engines, let's say with free front ends and hundreds of rules, uh, for us, it's in the order of 50, let's say 50 or 70 keywords on larger platforms. Uh, it, it's way easier to read those terms, understand what those relations mean, and test them rather than try to build or understand the larger authorization that's come in play. And so uh, I've just put one example of um, one of more interesting use case. So a player manager here is related to a tuple set of, uh, uh, in the namespace of master and has a relationship player related to, uh, so it's a master player relationship that makes it a player manager. So basically a master that has the relationship player related to uh, that, that player, he, he's, he's that player's manager. And the computed user set uh, also applies to master owner in order to, uh, the master's owner will also be player's manager. Uh, and the big advantage is for that infrastructure developer, because we don't want every developer to be doing this. We want only two or three of your developers doing this that like doing and working with tuples, but all the other developers benefit from it afterwards. And so here, you have your developer specialist that understands the tuples, that defines the rules to be inserted, player grat as player owner grat, master of the white label, with a relationship player with player grat, and the platform with the term white label, uh, with the term active on player grat. So those are more complex rules that were added later. And uh, this is just a subset. And you, want, you can check directly at compilation time uh, uh, of the authorization library that player grat, and, ha and grat is a player viewer of, of himself. And uh, you can check for. Uh, you can assert that other things are false as well in order to make sure that your validation makes sense. But that's kind of a big advantage of a methodology. You have some people specializing in authorization, and they manage it for everyone else. And you don't have to manually re-verify a lot of things. It's handled by the infrastructure for the developers. And uh, that's an example of tuple testing uh, uh, dedicated for those that, that do this. And here we have uh, an example of the entire flow uh, with a trace that's happening from the, the large-scale infrastructure that we showed before that goes down to the, the secondary cluster. So the first query comes, 
and it takes 40 milliseconds. It spends a bit of time in Afkeep, the, the first Afkeeper that we showed earlier. And then um, there's evaluation uh, at the Afkeeper level in terms of three milliseconds. It gets to the get user wallet, which was the first call that we saw earlier uh, at the proxy level. And from the proxy, it gets to the secondary get player. If you remember earlier, we showed that there's a decrepancy and a change at that layer of the proxy. And from the proxy, it goes to the internal load balancer in the secondary cluster. So we get again into a cluster. And then there's another, we have the secondary off keeper. It's a bit faster at evaluation. And then it gets to the final get player wallet within the microservice, the internal microservice. Uh, that's the first part of a trace. The second part of a trace is uh, uh, once we get to the get player wallet, it's down to 23 milliseconds. It performs the, get, uh, the check get player wallet. Uh, that's an internal call for Keto, and an internal call. But as you can see, there are two checks. The reason for having two checks is uh, Keto is checking that the player is indeed a viewer and that there's a relationship, a direct relationship compared to the one that is in Keto. So is a player viewer related to player owner? And the second check is yes. And so the chain is valid and the, the, the get balance is performed within the ORM and the user gets his query back and the change propagates all the way back to the front end. So it goes back through the entire chain back to, to the beginning. Uh, but uh, one part I didn't talk about is how do you make sure that your authorization are added correctly by your infrastructure related to what your developers are doing? So now we're going to talk rapidly about that part. Uh, if we, we're using EventStoreDB, and with EventStoreDB, we're monitoring here three streams. As an example, uh, player created, player activated, player suspended. We're using event sourcing, so developers feed those streams. And uh, this is a projection in Event Store DB, and it would automatically link it to another projection or another stream called authorization. So for the authorization, he's the authorization stream is listening to hundreds of internal streams in order to feed the authorization, uh, as we show here, all the, the platform users or the developers at the different commands. Those commands, such as player created, player activated, player suspended, get into even StoreDB in our case. But you could use Kafka. You could use NAT's Jetstream, uh, mostly even buses. And uh, the infrastructure listens to all those streams that are relevant to authorization. And from that, we insert the tuples into uh, the authorization engine. And from uh, there, it inserts it in AlloyDB. Uh, for us, that part is just for scalability. Uh, we're using uh, large-scale databases in order to have high performance there, because those checks are performed once on every single call. So it, it has to be performant. And so that's what I was talking about, about in terms of event sourcing. All our applicative services use uh, streams, and all the events from all the applicative side is pushed into a and even sourcing, you could technically do it without it and only push your authorization as an, uh, as an event sourcing part and keep all the rest of your infrastructure um, normal. But we did the effort of doing uh, even sourcing, so we did it on everything for us, uh, which means that uh, once new events are propagated, we're eventually consistent. Uh, the authorization, EH means event handler, pushes the, the rules for those different situations into the, whoops, into the database for Keto. And then uh, VRD authorization is capable of doing the rule expansion and check the same Keto in order to make sure everything is secure. So the, the advantage is here, once you've put that methodology, by the way, we're not the only ones doing that. A lot of the big organizations are also working with large-scale authorization engine. It's, it's the practical way to solve the big issues related to authorization. Uh, the examples we've just shown are just simple examples. Uh, it can get a lot more complex. And honestly, after doing that for a while, we wonder how 
developers manage complex authorization when there are seven types of user groups, five types of privileges and delegations in between. It's very tough to manage with tuples, so uh, I wonder how developers were doing it correctly, if they could do it correctly back in the day without even sourcing engines. And so this is a, just a small example for people to have the visibility on uh, the, an example of stream, such as player created. Uh, the player created stream here has all the events that are associated. It's basically for those that have never seen an event store, it's just a stream that contains all the events related to, to that context. And so you can do that for any type that you want, player, uh, and any type of secondary word to qualify what is happening. Usually it's for new objects. Like if somebody's uh, suspended or activated, that's related to the activation if an, an account is active. So that's why you had those, t those other terms. But you can think about dozens or hundreds of use cases. Do we have a permission to do, uh, uh, let's say, modify their cart, obtain uh, another account, open another account, uh, chat with somebody. You can do anything with the authorization. That's what Google is doing behind the scenes for cloud storage and GCP. They're using huge Zanzibar engines that do billions of queries per second on all the assets to validate systematically. This is the way that we're doing kind of the same thing, uh, but we've even, even sourcing at a smaller grade but the objective is to be secure by default and by design uh, with another method. We use tons of other services in order to do that. Uh, we're just doing it simpler at a smaller scale. But because we want security and we want speed, we ended up doing, having the same methodology. Uh, so um, the, what's, what are the key takeaways? Uh, it's not easy to implement the entire structure. Uh, a lot of banks haven't done it. Uh, when you look at who has implemented it, mostly there are a lot of groups are experimenting. Um, the, uh, the, I think there are just a few dozen who have completely implemented it in prod, the methodology with uh, authorization at scale like this. But we, I believe that it's the best way to simplify not only authentication, because a lot of you guys is, are probably using authentication services. It's becoming fairly standard. The authorization requires uh, a lot, uh, well, in our opinion, a lot better annotations by default. As you saw the rule expansion that we've shown before, uh, the annotations are heavier. You need the structure of protobufs to directly compile and obtain uh, a, a functional a functional service that implements it. And we thought that it's not mandatory, but even sourcing makes it implementable. So if you don't have access to a lot of streams coming from your developers out of their usual path, if you're trying to listen to a database, it becomes a lot more complex. You can miss things, whereas if you're using an event store in write-only, you get the advantage of seeing all the event and even correlate for let's say active, uh, let's say activate and then deactivate and then reactivate and then deactivate, be able to exactly follow the flow. If you have even sourcing and you have an even handler that, that's measuring both streams at the same time, it can have the logic and the timestamps in order to figure it, out, figure it out. Whereas if you do it from a database, uh, decrepancy between the operations might completely make it go disarray. So we thought uh, even sourcing really helps to, to do authorization in that fashion. Uh, and the other big thing is your CDs need to be very powerful in order to, to manage large fleets of microservices like that. Because if we saw before, uh, we have like seven types of microservices in our infra. And uh, in order to just generate a few, uh, one or two services, uh, business services, so you need to have the capability to be very, very efficient in your continuous deployment. Uh, we're almost 100% infrastructure as code on that part. So we deploy, that's how we deploy dozens to hundreds of services now. And finally, if we have, if there are other people that are interested in behaving or going in a similar way, so our effort doesn't go to waste, we can help. 
And particularly if you want to customize the Ori stack, uh, we have it implemented uh, for everything from validating tokens to the uh, authorization and open ID engines with Hydra to Keto for the authorization engine. Uh, we use the entire stack and we heavily collaborate with the Ori group for that part. And uh, again, uh, Pivotal and Pivotal.tech for our libraries. Uh, hope you enjoyed the, the talk. Thank you.